That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. It is the first human footstep on the moon, and the world is forever changed. Fantastic feeling. It was one of uh, great accomplishment. It was almost miraculous. We did it for all the right reasons. We did come in peace for all mankind. On July 20th, 1969, as the lunar dust compresses beneath the boot of astronaut Neil Armstrong, NASA's Apollo project scores a bullseye. Until the fall of 1957, the moon is Earth's only satellite, orbiting for eons in silent vigil. That October, the hush of space and America's sense of security is shattered by Sputnik. The sound of the Soviet satellite becomes eerily familiar to Americans. Fears escalate that the Cold War could heat up with catastrophic effect. Immediately, everyone thought, well, they're now able to really send their, their military machines around the world up above who is not going to be in danger. President Eisenhower combined several agencies working on rocketry and flight to create one civilian agency, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Over the next years, the United States successfully launches satellites with great scientific payback. To prepare for human flight, several animals, including a chimpanzee named Ham, survive the ride to space and back. But once again, these American accomplishments are eclipsed by the Soviet space machine. April 12, 1961, cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin becomes the first human in space. To temper this latest Soviet triumph, the U.S. needs to put its own man in space. That man is astronaut Alan Shepard. Shepard's flight had a tremendous impact. I think it was the leading technological accomplishment of that era and uh, led to the whole future of the exploration to the moon. Unlike Gagarin's 108-minute orbit of Earth, Shepard's suborbital flight, the nation's lone human venture into space, lasts just 15 minutes. Nonetheless, President Kennedy goes before Congress and lays down the gauntlet. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. The combination of the Gagarin flight and the Bay of Pigs uh, uh, disaster with Cuba, I think, uh, pushed Kennedy towards something that would be positive and would show that we were ahead of uh, the Soviet Union. President Kennedy's interest in space moves beyond just beating the Soviets. As his passion grows, so does his rhetoric. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. It will take an all-out effort by thousands of dedicated Americans to design and build the machines and methodologies needed to succeed one small step at a time. Godspeed, John Glenn. February 20th, 1962. John Glenn circumnavigates the Earth three times. The single most important factor was that man could survive and perform as well at zero gravity as he could at 1G. Zero G and I feel fine. By May 1963, the U.S. Mercury program flies six manned flights, but the last, Gordon Cooper's 34-hour solo mission, still leaves the moon out of America's reach. The Gemini program is the next step. 
its larger capsule carries two astronauts. Mercury veteran Gus Grissom flies with John Young aboard Gemini 3, the program's first manned flight. On Gemini 4, Ed White opens the hatch and steps out into the void as America's first spacewalker. Extravehicular activity, EVA, in NASA speak, is critical to a moon mission. Go. Five, four, three, two, one. So, too, is the ability of two spacecraft to meet up, or rendezvous in space. It happens on Jim Lovell's first flight. The first rendezvous of Gemini 6 with Gemini 7, I think, was a, was a magnificent milestone uh, in the quest to go to the moon, because we had to determine the types of rendezvous that we want to do around the moon, and we first had it just about around the Earth. By Gemini's 12th and final mission, rendezvous and docking are well practiced. Gemini 12, Houston Capcom, one minute to LOS, new EVA record, beautiful job. NASA is now ready to shoot for the moon. But there are just three years left to meet President Kennedy's goal, and no one really knows how close the highly secretive Soviets are and of the moon itself, little is known. Could be dust up to 25, 30 feet thick. If you landed on it, you would sink into the moon. If you landed on it and, and set, set out some fire from the rockets, we exhaust it would cause this huge inferno on the lunar surface. The, what would the radiation problems on the moon from the sun? What were the thermal conditions you had to deal with on the lunar surface? Getting answers falls to a series of robotic spacecraft. In mid-1966, Surveyor 1 lands on the lunar surface. The 11,000 photos it sends back help to dispel fear and clear the way for the Apollo moon landing program. Two short months after the final Gemini flight, astronauts Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee are posing for photos and spending hours in simulators as they prepare for the first Apollo mission less than a month away. January 27, 1967. The crew is in the capsule, mounted atop an unfueled Saturn 1B for a dress rehearsal of the countdown sequence. Now we gotta get the moon, we can't talk between two or three buildings. A series of problems has already raised tensions at the launch pad. When five and a half hours into the test, Ed White's shouts are heard. Oh, no fire in the culture. At that point, things progressed with absolutely stunning speed. I mean, it was only a matter of 20 seconds before the crew was unconscious. Moments later, the pressure from the fire had increased to the point where it literally ruptured the hull of the spacecraft. Toxic smoke spewed into the white room. The technicians were struggling to get the hatch open and rescue the crew, but they were driven back by the intense heat and the, and the smoke. Many long minutes passed before they could open the hatch, and of course, by that point, the crew had died. All three astronauts were dead. The loss of Grissom, White, and Chaffee momentarily cripples NASA's moon landing program. But as the three astronauts are given heroes' burials, Apollo, like another mythological figure, Phoenix, begins its rise from the ashes. Following recommendations of an accident review board, the Apollo command module is redesigned and rewired for safety, all under the wary eye 
of the astronauts who will fly it. 20 months later, from the same pad Apollo 1 had occupied, Apollo 7 roars off for an 11-day shakedown in Earth orbit. We inherited the first manned Apollo mission, which turned out to be Apollo 7. But as with many things with NASA, what was a disaster with Apollo 1 turned out to be a, a real triumph with Apollo 7 because the spacecraft itself was a marvelous flying machine. It's also the first time live television shows Earth-bound humans what it's like to be in space. It's as from that uh, lovely Apollo something. You guys should write Apollo it. Room. High atop everything. High atop everything. Apollo 7's success restores some swagger to America's space program. But there are reports the Soviets may be closing in on the moon. The original plan was for Apollo 8 to be a, an Earth orbit test, uh, but uh, the lunar module wasn't ready. And so the decision was made to um, actually do a, a circumnavigation of the moon. So that's what, uh, that's what actually happened uh, in December of 1968. The engines are on. Four, three, two, one, zero. Commander Frank Borman, veteran astronaut Jim Lovell, and rookie Bill Anders are the first humans to ride the Saturn V 7.5 million pounds of thrust. We were way up on the top, like a bug on the, a ladybug on the end of your automobile's whip antenna. So as these big engines were thrashing around to keep this thing straight up, boy, the, end of the ladybug was getting thrashed. And uh, it was so loud, we couldn't talk. The vibration, the thrashing was violent, and you couldn't see the instrument panel. But uh, when we cleared the pad and uh, had some aerodynamic stability and didn't have this noise, why, thing, uh, things steadied out. and. Uh, by that time, my heart stopped racing. <laughs> Apollo 8 is the first time humans venture beyond Earth's gravity. Lovell marvels at never seen before sights. I can see the entire Earth now out of the center window. I can see Florida, Cuba, Central America. Christmas Eve day, 1968. With the moon dwarfing the nearing spacecraft, Commander Borman fires the main engine on the Apollo service module. The craft slows, then slides into orbit around the moon. The world watches in awe, but none more so than the three men peering out the tiny windows of their capsule. We were the first three people to leave the confines of the Earth and be captured by another body. First time three people saw the far side of the moon. Uh, first time that we had gone so far, and the first time that we saw the Earth from 240,000 miles away. So in that respect, I kind of thought that Apollo 8 was really a milestone and a, and a high point in my career. The vast loneliness up here on the moon is uh, awe-inspiring, and it makes you realize just what you have back there on Earth. The Earth from here is a grand oasis of the big vastness of space. As the moon's pockmarked surface slips quietly by, the Apollo 8 crew ends its Christmas Eve broadcast with a special message for those back home. And from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. For all its success, Apollo 8 is missing one key component for a moon landing. The lunar module, still being built, is overweight and behind schedule. It's not a simple thing. The spacecraft never landed on another celestial body, so the design had to be done from scratch. One of the main things you had to figure out was that uh, you had to have a rocket uh, on the ascent stage especially that you had to be 100% sure would work because you didn't want the two astronauts sitting on the lunar surface and the rocket didn't work. The first LEM is ready for testing in Earth orbit on Apollo 9. The LEM is put through its paces and proves it's ready to go to the moon. With one significant limitation. 
Still too heavy, the Lem can't land. So Apollo 10, like Apollo 8 before it, will only orbit the moon and test rendezvous the lander with the command module. This is really a rugged planet. As John Young watches from his command module, Charlie Brown, Commander Tom Stafford and LEM pilot Gene Cernan undock Snoopy, their lander that can't. And I was uh, doing backup maneuvers to the attitudes, and if they couldn't do the maneuvers, I would do the maneuvers and hopefully rescue them. But I was always ready in case uh, their, their vehicle blew up or something to come back without them. To test a landing approach, the LEM drops to within nine miles of the moon's surface and gets a good look at the site NASA has selected for the first touchdown. Skimming the surface at nearly 3,700 miles an hour, Cernan peers out his window at Lunar Mountains. We are down among them, Charlie. Roger, I hear you weaving your way up the freeway. Uh... Roger, fantastic, Charlie, fantastic. I felt like I had to pick up my feet to keep from dragging my, my heels on the top of those mountains. When you move that fast across the surface and you're that close, uh, it's, it's, it's an overpowering experience. On their second flyover, the experience turns almost deadly when the lunar module tumbles out of control. I saw the lunar horizon eight times in 15 seconds in all different directions. Uh, that was a man-made problem because we were switching computers to check out a little backup computer we had. The guidance switch had to go in the other direction. I had already put it in the other direction. And so Tom went and moved it in the other direction and so the computer that had the spacecraft at that moment didn't know where it was. But Tom was able to stop it, control it. Finally, as in the comics, Snoopy returns to his master, Charlie Brown. Even before Apollo 10 enters lunar orbit, the Apollo 11 spacecraft has been rolled out to the launch pad atop its Saturn V rocket. In less than two months, its crew will try and safely set it down on the moon. That's one small step for man. I was in the student houses at Caltech and we were watching the TV and all the excitement about you know, landing on another celestial object. And I had no idea that one day I'd become the director of JPL. Uh, but reflecting back on it, I mean, that was really something I remember forever. They've all been to space before. Commander Neil Armstrong on Gemini 8. Command module pilot Michael Collins on Gemini 10. Lunar module pilot Buzz Aldrin set an EVA record on the final Gemini flight. The morning of July 16, 1969, spectators line the beaches around the Kennedy Space Center. America will attempt to end the space race. Moon fever is rampant. And there was just great excitement, and you could hear lots of people saying, gosh, this is almost, un I can't believe that somebody's going to go to the moon. T-minus 15 seconds, guidance is internal, 12. 11, 10, 9, ignition sequence start, 6. At 9.32 a.m., the Saturn V's giant engines roar to life. At the viewing stand, three miles away, spectators feel the thunderous drumbeat of unearthly power pounding their chests as the heat of the rocket's exhaust washes over them. When that rumble came across the ground, it was like somebody was putting their hands on your chest and pressing. I almost couldn't breathe. It was so unbelievable that the United States was going to send two men to walk on the surface of the moon. It was almost unthinkable. For three days, the crew of Apollo 11 cruises towards the moon, then drops its spacecraft into lunar orbit. I just thought there were so many unknowns that 
I would have given us about a 50-50 chance of, uh, of being the first flight to, to land and return someone safely. With Collins remaining in the command module, Armstrong and Aldrin prepare the LEM and themselves to become the first humans on the moon. Okay, all flight controllers, gonna go for landing. Retro. Go. Righto. Go. Guidance. Go. Control. Go. 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 The onboard computer flashes an alarm the crew doesn't recognize. 1201, 1201, Roger, 1201 alarm. Any one of thousands of technical glitches could abort the landing. But Houston quickly diagnoses the problem as non critical an overloaded computer. 1201 alarm. Same guys. type, we're go, flight. Okay, we're, we're go. go. Same type, we're go. That's when real trouble threatens the mission. 540 feet down at 30, and at 15. As the LEM pitches upright about a mile above the moon's surface, Armstrong gets his first look at where computers will set them down. A field of boulders, any one of which could prove deadly. Armstrong wraps his hand around the joystick and takes manual control. Three and a half down, 20 feet. 13 forward. With fuel running out. Armstrong flies the LEM like a helicopter. Aldrin keeps his eye on their altitude, forward speed, and rate of descent, calling out the numbers. 100 feet, three and a half down, nine forward. At 60 seconds, we're still 100 feet up. I was nervous. Okay, at 30 seconds, we were 10 feet. I figured we had it made. But 100 feet, we're Thereabouts, at 60 forward. seconds, you can very easily just not be where you want to be. Or forward, drift into the right a little. Sort of like uh, driving your car when the uh, gas gauge is reading uh, empty, but you know that uh, when it gets down there, you got a few more miles left. Well, that was the situation we faced. And I think it was in the last seconds. Uh, everybody was holding their breath. It was uh, pretty dicey. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. APA at a descent. Boat control, both auto, descent, engine command override off. Engine arm off. 413 is in. We've had shut down. We copy you down, Eagle. Okay, hey, everybody, uh, T1, stand by for T1. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. Man on the moon. Ooh. Oh, boy. Thank you. You're looking wow. good here. Mm. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, we're gonna be busy for a minute. Mm. Like people around the world, of every persuasion and from every walk of life, mission controllers in Houston are overwhelmed. Okay, keep the chatter down in this room. Now in the control room, we had work to do because we had to very rapidly look at the spacecraft systems and give the crew a stay-no-stay -no -stay decision that everything was safe to remain in the moon, and we had to accomplish that within the first two minutes. Okay, T1, stay-no-stay, -no -stay. retro. Stay. Fido. Stay. Guidance. Stay. Control. Stay. Telcom. Stay. GNC. Stay. Ecom. Stay. Surgeon. Stay. Capcom, or stay for T1. So basically, we had to keep our emotions in check and keep the chatter down for the first two hours after landing while everybody in the entire world was celebrating. And we're getting a picture on the TV. You got a good picture, huh? It's distorted, flickering, and at first, upside down. But a small black and white television camera mounted outside the LEM gives the world its first live glimpse of an alien landscape. No one is more interested in seeing that first picture than the man responsible for bringing it to everyone's TV. This whole mission was now about television, in my mind. Uh, there were hundreds of millions of people watching, waiting to see the first step on the moon and people on the moon, uh, see a spacecraft on the moon, anything. And if it doesn't work, uh, then probably people who actually will know my name years from now is the, the guy who didn't bring you television from the moon. 
Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. The world just marveled at this right along with us, and we more or less made the whole world our, our partners in this thing by inviting people to be there during the launches. And uh, I think that's one of the best things we ever, we ever did in the space program, one of the best decisions ever made with regard to the space program was uh, to share that with the world. Okay, I just checked, uh, getting back up to that first step. Uh, it's, uh, that hasn't collapsed too far, but uh, it's adequate to get back up. More than 500 million people around the globe watch as Armstrong first makes sure he can get back into the LEM, then gives the first eyewitness account from the lunar surface. The surface appears to be uh, very, very fine-grained as you get close to it. It's almost like a powder. Six and a half hours after landing on the Sea of Tranquility, Neil Armstrong steps off the footpad of the lunar lander and ends the race to the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. For two hours and 31 minutes, Armstrong and Aldrin share their observations. The surface is fine and powdery. I can kick it up loosely with my toe. There seems to be no difficulty in moving around as, as we suspected. It has a stark beauty all its own. It's uh, like much of the high desert of uh, the United States. It's uh, different, but it's very pretty out here. Beautiful view. Isn't that something? Magnificent sight out here. Magnificent desolation. Aldrin says magnificent, but thinks otherwise. What a desolate place we just landed on. Absolutely no life, no color, really, until you get down and look at the minerals in the rocks, because everything's covered with, with this little dust. They are the only two beings here, but Armstrong and Aldrin have come for all humanity. Here, men from the planet Earth, first set foot upon the moon, July 1969, AD. We came in peace for all mankind. The primary and secondary juts are in good shape. With future moon landings dependent upon its integrity, the LEM is examined closely. Uh, antennas, uh, in place. Uh, there's no evidence of a uh, problem underneath the uh, lamb due to either the engine exhaust or a uh, drainage of any kind. What little science this mission has time for is conducted with a seismometer. A core sampling is taken. I hope you're watching uh, how hard I have to hit this into the ground uh, to the tune of about five inches, Houston. No trip is complete without souvenirs. Commander Armstrong tallies up their take of moon rocks for study back on Earth. And we got about, uh, I'd say, 20 pounds of uh, carefully selected, if not documented, samples. Houston, Roger, well done, out. As Armstrong and Aldrin study the moon, controllers in Houston watch closely over them. Their life-sustaining suits have limited supplies of oxygen and power, and they're reaching their safety margins. Buzz, this is Houston. It's about time for you to start your EVA closeout activities. Roger. 19 minutes later, the first moonwalk is over. Our plane hatch is closed and latched. As the ascent stage of the Eagle takes flight, and Tranquility Base recedes beneath it, the magnitude of the accomplishment begins to sink in for Chris Kraft. In terms of technology, in terms of advancement of the state of the art in science and technology, it was probably the most productive 10 years in the history of man. And when you reflect back on it, it probably was even greater than I could comprehend today. With a scant five months to spare, NASA has met President Kennedy's goal. America has gained preeminence in human spaceflight. Yet it's only the beginning. Lunar exploration and science are Apollo's new mission, 
and the program will land 10 more men on the moon to fulfill it. That's one small step for man. We're in the viewing room at the Mission Control Center in Houston, watching the terminal phase of, of that flight and the, the landing itself on the moon. I was telling Neil not to land because we were next. <laughs> but he did a great job. One, one, one giant leap for mankind. Every Apollo mission starts the same. Three men in a capsule sit atop the giant Saturn V rocket, waiting for its monstrous engines to propel them off the Earth. The three-stage Saturn V stands 363 feet tall and at launch weighs more than six million pounds. Its three stages generate nearly nine million pounds of thrust it is the largest rocket ever flown. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engines running, commit, liftoff. When Apollo 12 leaves pad 39A on the second moon landing mission, the Saturn V proves its mettle. 36 seconds after lifting off in a rainstorm, lightning hits the rocket and waylays the crew's control panel. I don't know what happened here. We had everything in the world drop out. I'm not sure if you get hit by lightning. 16 seconds later, as if to confirm Commander Pete Conrad's theory, a second lightning bolt strikes the rocket. Command module pilot Dick Gordon watches his entire electrical system shut down. The moment of the lightning strike, the reverse current relays did their job and shut down the fuel cells. So we were not receiving any electrical power from the, from the fuel cells, which was our main source of, uh, of electrical energy. Fortunately, at that time, the batteries were on the line for the launch itself, so we had electrical power, and, and uh, that, that really saved us from automatic abort. 13 Saturn V rockets fly during Apollo, including every moon mission. Although anomalies occur, no Saturn V ever fails. I think I see my crater. Hey, baby, I'm not sure. Including Apollo 12s. There it is, son of a gun, right down the middle of the road. A major goal of the mission is to execute a pinpoint landing in an area called the Ocean of Storms. So NASA said, we're gonna demonstrate this by picking a certain crater and then we'll uh, send you there. And the crater we're gonna pick is the one that has Surveyor 3 in that landed inside this crater some 33 months earlier. And that may have been a small one for Neil, but that's a long one for me. And we landed and the first thing Pete did when he got out was go around and look and see if Surveyor was in that crater. Boy, you'll never believe it. That's what I see sitting on the side of the crater. The old surveyor, the huh? old surveyor, yes, sir. <laughs> Does that look neat? It can't be any further than 600 feet from here. We have a good shot of you there, Pete. Live television from the moon is now in color. Okay, Houston, I'm going to move the TV camera now. But the achievement is short lived when Alan Bean accidentally points the camera at the sun and burns out its video tube. Pete and I didn't know that, and so when it burns out, we're standing around not knowing why. Now, the people on the ground knew immediately why, but they never told us. They never said, you pointed it at the sun, it's ruined forever. Al, we have a pretty bright image on that yeah, TV. Could you either move it or uh, stop it down? That's as far as it goes, Houston. How does that look to you? No, it still, still is the same, Al. Big disappointment to all of us and everyone on Earth Someone told me one day, they said, there's one thing good about it that came out of it. We used to have discussions that maybe we shouldn't have a TV. They said, after your mission, <laughs> never had that discussion anymore. Everybody agreed we needed TV. NASA closes out the 60s by landing humans on the moon. Not once, but twice. The third attempt comes to be known as NASA's most successful failure. Okay, yes, we've had a problem here. That's 
One small step for man. It's pretty indelible. I remember sitting in my parents' bedroom in front of the old black and white zenith. It was truly an incredible moment, and I knew that I was witnessing something that was absolutely a turning point in human history. One, one, one giant leap for mankind. Apollo 13, the third planned moon landing. Commander Jim Lovell's second trip to the moon. This time, he'll not only orbit the lunar surface, but also leave his footprints in its powdery dust. Uh, here's the way Apollo. But instead of describing a lunar landscape, Lovell finds himself halfway to the moon, talking with mission control about his dying command module. May be bus interval. Roger, main B interval. Stand by a 13, we're looking at it. Electrical power is disrupted and readings in the capsule and at mission control don't jibe. Then Lovell sees something out his window. Now look to me, looking out the uh, hatch, so we are venting something. We are, uh, we are venting something out uh, into the uh, into space. The explosion of an oxygen tank in the service module has damaged several key systems. The astronauts must scour 24 instruments, 40 alarm indicators, 71 lights and 566 switches to regain control of their spacecraft. With the loss of oxygen, because we used oxygen to produce electricity, all of our electrical power would quit. And when that happened, because we controlled our engine by means of electrical power, we'd lose the entire propulsion system. And so, you know, essentially uh, it, took a, it took a while for the, all that to sink in that it dawned on me that we were in very serious, serious trouble. The crew of Apollo 13 never gets the chance to land on the moon. They can only slingshot around it and, with their lunar module Aquarius as their lifeboat, hope to make their way safely back to Earth. We had to invent ways to navigate. We had to find ways to stretch the electrical power. Our crew was suffocating. We had to find ways to remove the carbon dioxide so the crew wouldn't suffer from uh, CO2 poisoning. We never had discussed the possibility of uh, not surviving or getting back to the Earth. It was probably in all of our minds, uh, but uh, uh, we were uh, working hard to figure out what we had to work with and, and what we had to do to get back. The command module shut down and unheated for three days would now have to be restarted. Condensation is everywhere. The whole instrument panel was covered with water. And of course, I knew that there was water probably behind the panel on all the wiring harnesses. And so we worried about electric short. We were virtually going down rows and pushing in circuit breakers. We figured the best we could do is we started down the row and started smelling. You can smell electric short. We'd back up and pull some out and hope we could quickly isolate which was the culprit. But there are no shorts, due perhaps to the capsule redesign after the Apollo 1 fire. Sealing the electrical connections also means they're now waterproof for landing. That's good. Farewell, Aquarius. Thank you. After its harrowing six-day ordeal, Apollo 13 safely splashes down in the Pacific. The moon landing mission may have failed, but flight director Gene Krantz remembers it as the space team's finest hour. NASA contractor, people out in subcontractors, and test facilities, and individual. It was, uh, it was really, uh, really amazing to be at the point of the spear and uh, watch this team perform, basically against all odds, and to come up with solutions that we had never trained or thought about before. While just getting to the moon can prove difficult, landing on its dusty, boulder-strewn, cratered surface is even more problematic. A lunar lander must maneuver like a helicopter, with its rotors replaced by rocket engines. Training with the LEM in Earth's atmosphere is impossible. 
so the Lunar Lander Research Vehicle is used. The Apollo astronauts call it the Flying Bedstead. To simulate the one-sixth gravity of the moon, the LLRV's central jet engine supports most of the vehicle's weight. But flying the LLRV is dangerous. On the afternoon of May 6, 1968, the craft nearly kills Neil Armstrong. Astronaut Bill Anders had flown the same vehicle just hours earlier. The thing flamed out. The attitude control system uh, ran out of fuel, and so Neil was flopping around there and man just managed to get out of it. Well, he was very lucky because this thing was just on its main engine with no attitude control and uh, was getting close to the ground and it just leveled, kind of rolled out and Neil came, looked like he came out of the fireball. And it did look like he went back into the fireball when he, uh, with his parachute, but he landed just beyond it. Four of these earthbound trainers are used. Three will crash, but the actual lunar modules land safely every time. There's good stuff. Okay, looking great. 60 seconds. 40 feet. 3 feet per second. America's first astronaut, Alan Shepard, returns to space flight 10 years later to command Apollo 14's LEM and Terry's to a skillful setdown. We're on the surface. Okay, we made a good landing. Apollo 14 is on the moon almost 34 hours. About a third of that time is spent moonwalking in the lunar highlands. Certainly the Fra Mauro area where we landed was an interesting place and uh, with far more relief up and down of the terrain than the earlier flights, which also made the navigation a little more difficult. Particularly, it was kind of like wandering around in the sand dunes and one sand dune looks about like the other. So finding our landmarks that the geologists wanted us to find as we did our traverse on foot to Cone Crater was difficult. I'm going to try an old sand trap shot here. But Shepard manages a few seconds to become not only America's first man in space, but also its first golfer. Miles and miles and miles. Two miles is all the Apollo 14 astronauts are able to walk during their two EVAs. But the next mission will have wheels. This is really a rock and roll ride, isn't it? That's one small step for man. Is that something? I was in Orlando uh, in my parents' house, and as the first pictures came through, we were, of course, all just very enthusiastic and enthralled with what was happening. One, one, one giant leap for man. When Apollo 15 Commander Dave Scott descends the LEMS ladder two years after Neil Armstrong, he achieves his own first. Scott climbs aboard the first lunar rover with crewmate Jim Irwin and, as space first motorist, proceeds to peel out. This is really a rock and roll ride, isn't it? Never been on a ride like this before. Oh boy. I'm glad they got this great suspension system on this thing. More than just a toy, the moon buggy is a science platform, allowing astronauts to venture farther from the LEM than the previous three Apollo missions. During 10 and a half hours, Scott and Irwin cover 17 miles and examine many interesting sights. A boulder exposed to the surface here, which has got the uh, layering within it. It's been weathered away, apparently, and uh, just the surface top is exposed, but the boulder must be uh, oh, about a meter long with uh, two to three inch layers in it. Working in a suit is very fatiguing. Uh, you don't get the food, the water, the rest. So actually, we are not only probing the, the boundaries of uh, geology and exploration, we are also probing the boundaries of human performance. Uh, the Apollo 15 mission 
uh, really took us back to the drawing board in several areas to look at the, how we train crews and how we provide them adequate nutrition and hydration and all of these things. Hey, John, this is perfect with the limb and the rover and you and, and uh, Stone Mountain and the old flag. Come on out here and give me a salute. Big Navy salute. In the summer of 1972, Apollo 16 astronauts John Young and Charlie Duke spend 20 hours searching for volcanic rock in the Descartes Highlands. Ah, uh -huh. uh, Charlie, such form. Oh, How about that? Well, that's the best I'm going out for the ballet when I get back. You learn another line of work up here because of the geological diversity uh, uh, of the moon. Uh, they wanted to get some samples uh, from the mountains of the moon, if you will, or the highlands, which was uh, a considerable elevation above the Luna Mari. That is the most beautiful sight. What's that? You're standing there on the rim of that crater. Well, it's great to have a lunar rover. When you turn the uh, wheels, the front wheels would go this way and the rear wheels would go that way. So you could turn in your own diameter. And because of all the holes on the moon, you need to be able to do that. Ah, here he comes, folks. He's got the hammer out. I knew he couldn't resist. I don't know if this will work or not, Charlie. But it couldn't pick a better spot. Here we go. Hot dog. He did it. It's a very friable rock, apparently, Houston. Yeah, hey, outstanding. Science was certainly in the front seat. Of the six landings on the moon, the last three, I think, were devoted uh, completely to the science here? of it. We'll sample uh, right there and get you a, a scoop full of this underlying uh, regolith. There'll be just one more flight to the moon. Apollo 17 lifts off in the midnight hour of December 7th, 1972. My God, it was like the sun coming up in the middle of the night. I mean, all of a sudden this golden light, this flame that was the color of a sunrise, just exploding and filling the sky and filling, filling my field of view and in silence seeing this rocket ascend and then without anticipating it, this roar of, of sound that just swept over us. It was absolutely spectacular. I mean, I've seen launches since then. But I don't think anything can compare with knowing that you're seeing three people who are on their way to the moon. Okay, stand by for pitch over. Oh, are we coming in? Oh, baby. And there it is, Houston. There's Camelot. Wow. 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 Target. I see it. Being the last mission, we built on all the other missions before us. And so our landing site was in the northeastern edge of the, of the moon, which was off center. We landed in a valley the Valley of Taurus Littrow that was surrounded by mountains on three sides higher than a Grand Canyon is deep. About, I don't know, give or take 20 miles long and maybe five miles across. Okay, Houston, the Challenger has landed. That's your Challenger, that's super. Houston, you can tell America that Challenger is at Taurus Littrow. We landed within a couple hundred feet of our landing site. Pretty exciting. If America's moon missions must end with Apollo 17, Commander Gene Cernan makes it memorable. Can you use the other end against the right side of the rock? Oh, yeah. His partner, Jack Schmidt, is the only trained geologist to fly to the moon. At times, his mission zeal overtakes his ability to traverse the terrain. <laughs> no, dead coming. Well, hey, 
Hey, Gene, would you, have, would, would you go over and help twinkle toes, please, Gene? Really? Well, working on the moon is a lot of fun. I mean, it's like walking around on a giant trampoline all the time, and you're just as strong as you were here on Earth, but you don't weigh as much. You only weigh one-sixth of what you weigh on the moon, even I with a suit. Uh, in the backpack, uh, my total weight was only 61 pounds. Cernan has been to space twice before, including on Apollo 10's lunar orbit checkout of the LEM. Yet Cernan is awestruck by this valley and what hangs in the pitch black sky overhead. You have to pinch yourself when you're on a moon. Am I really here at this point in time in space? And the answer is yes, but it's almost like you're in the middle of some science fiction plot. Because back there is the earth, the multicolored blues of the oceans and the whites of the snow and the clouds you see from pole to pole, cross oceans every 12 hours you look at the other side of the world. It truly is an ongoing, overpowering experience. Meanwhile, Schmidt finds unexpected color in the gray moonscape. There is orange soil. Well, don't move it till I see it. It's all over. Orange. Don't move it till I see it. I've stirred it up with my feet. Hey, it is. I can see it from here. It's orange. Once it was back in the laboratory, everyone realized it was, uh, it was volcanic material that had been erupted uh, in the uh, valley and somehow protected for three and a half billion years without getting mixed up with everything else. Uh, and it has become a very, very important sample, an increasingly important sample in trying to decipher what the actual origin of the moon might be. The next day, Cernan ends Apollo 17's 75-hour sortie as the last man on the moon. This valley of history has uh, seen mankind complete its first evolutionary steps into the universe, leaving the planet Earth and going forward into the universe. I think uh, no more significant contribution has Apollo made to history. It's not often that you can foretell history, but I think we can in this case. When I left the moon and made those final steps, I looked back down and I, I, at, my, at my last footstep on the moon, I, I, I'm not coming this way again. I wanted to stop the clock. I wanted to push the freeze button. I needed time to try and understand where I've been and what I've done, what the last 75 hours have meant to me, have meant to you. Was the risk worth what I have just whatever it was I've just done and wherever I've been. I couldn't stop the clock and look back at the earth and, 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 and came to a conclusion, you know, I, I don't know what it all means yet, but I've been lucky. On December 14th, 1972, human exploration of the moon is ceased. Two, one, ignition. Right away, Houston. What I felt was a sense of disappointment at a great adventure that was ending before its time. And also the sense of a grand human adventure that had ended too soon. We had just begun to scratch the surface of what the moon could tell us. And we go there and we can actually turn the pages in the earliest history of the solar system, which is recorded on the moon like no other place in the solar system. Apollo really was a blip in human history in a number of ways, uh, but uh, it was an anomaly that I think the, the country will never forget, the world will never forget. I think it was worth it, uh, not only for the in the geopolitical context, which is what drove the whole thing, but also from the exploration context. I am not the last man to have walked on a moon, maybe the last man of Apollo, maybe the last man of the 20th century, uh, but not the last person not the last man or possibly the last woman to have walked on a moon. Today, the moon is again coming within our grasp. And again, 40 years later, Apollo will help us reach it. A new generation of moon machines is being built and tested. Many of the new designs are directly descended from Apollo hardware, including the lunar lander. 
Engineers are eager to hear from the man who flew the first one to land. And I don't know exactly where the CG is and so on, but sometimes the amount mm -hmm. of motion that you get at the cockpit is different than the amount that the footpads mm -hmm. are seeing by a substantial it's margin. Significant. And you have to get a sense of that to know how careful you have to be up on top to make sure the bottom is doing the right thing. The next generation lunar rover will bear little resemblance to the Apollo buggy. Its explorers will drive the moonscape in shirt sleeves. The key thing about this vehicle is it's a small pressurized rover. So we actually live in the vehicle under pressure. The suits are hanging off the back on devices called suit ports. What we do is we literally open a hatch inside the vehicle, open the back hatch of the suit, step into the suit, and 10 minutes later we're boots on the surface sampling rocks. In a, an Apollo-style unpressurized rover, you've got eight hours of consumables in your suit, so you have to go out and turn around and come back at the end of each day, whereas here we're gonna live in it. The next astronauts to make footprints in the lunar dust will stay longer explore farther, and learn more than ever hoped for on July 20th, 1969, when Apollo 11 changed the world forever. It's something that I always hoped would happen in my lifetime, and to see it happening now, um, to potentially be a part of it, and uh, whether it's my foot on the moon or, or one of my classmates or, you know, somebody from my generation is going to do it, and I just... I think it's great. We did a, a lot of great work uh, in the 1960s and 70s when we went to the moon. But unfortunately, we didn't stay there uh, very long. Now, with their experience, especially under the belt of what we got from the International Space Station and the capability that the crew exploration vehicle gives us, we can actually really explore the moon. It's a, it's a whole new planet, a whole new world to go explore. And we've only been to, to six little small spots on it. Now we can go more places. We have a chance to stay there longer. The human endeavor which people put forth to get us to the moon is the human endeavor we once again need. The spirit of Apollo, the legacy of Apollo is that human endeavor to do what has never been done before, to reach further than we've ever reached before. Uh, to be willing to try, to, to not be deterred by failure. Uh, that's, what, that's what Apollo was all about. And as the centuries unfold, we'll go many, many places, but this is the first, and this needs to be remembered as one of the wonderful things of the 20th century. It is a great adventure.